Francis Peter from Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia, www.wikipedia.org, recorded May 4, 2005. Table of Contents Introduction Early Life Architectural Career St. Dominic's Priory Cathedrals St. Joseph's Cathedral Cathedral of the Sacred Heart Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament Private Houses Personal Life Evaluation Works by Peter References Further Reading External Links Notes Introduction Francis William Peter, known as Frank, born August 27, 1847, died December 10, 1918, was a prominent New Zealand-born architect based in Dunedin. Before his time, 19th century New Zealand architecture was dominated by an almost institutionalized Gothic Revival style favored by the British Empire for its far-flung colonies. Peter, one of the first of New Zealand's native-born architects, played an important part in guiding it towards the brighter Palladian and Renaissance Southern European styles which were more suited to New Zealand's climate than the gloomier Gothic. Able to work competently in a wide diversity of architectural styles, he was also notable for his pioneering work in concrete development and construction. He designed numerous public and private buildings, many of which are still standing in and around Dunedin. Today, his private houses are among the most distinguished and sought after in New Zealand. However, he is chiefly remembered for the monumental Roman Catholic cathedrals of Wellington, Christchurch, and Dunedin, which survive today as testimony to his talent and architectural expertise. Early Life the Peters were an aristocratic family from Ingotston in Essex, England. Francis Peters' immediate family was one of the first and most prominent colonial families of New Zealand. Peter Bay, Chatham Island, was named after them, as, originally, was the town of Wanganui in the North Island. The Wellington suburb of Thorndon was named after the family's Thorndon Hall estate in England. Peter was the son of the Honorable Henry William Peter, who first came to New Zealand in 1840 as director of the New Zealand Company, of which his own father, Lord Peter, had been chairman. The New Zealand Company had been set up to promote the colonization of New Zealand, and bought, sometimes dubiously, thousands of hectares of land from the Maori. As a consequence, Henry Peter was one of the founders of Wellington. He was also colonial treasurer of Newmunster. Henry seems to have been a man of strange appearance, from the description by his contemporary, the New Zealand social commentator Charlotte Godley, Quote, he is immensely tall and thin and looks like a set of fire irons badly hung together. Unquote. Francis Peter was born in 1847 at Petone, today a suburb of Lower Hutt in the North Island, which was one of the earliest British settlements in New Zealand. In 1855, in the then British colonial tradition, Peter was sent to England to be educated. He attended the Mount St. Mary College in the north of England, where he was taught by the Jesuits. After four years, he left to attend the Royal Naval College, then at Portsmouth. The college moved to Greenwich in 1869. Finding himself unsuited to a naval career, he pursued his education in France, where he attended the charismatic priest Benoit Hafreng's college at Boulogne-sur-Mer. Returning to England, he completed his education at Ushaw College, Durham. Members of British aristocratic families at this time seldom had to earn a living, as they would generally be possessed of a private income and enter one of the military services or the church. However, as the third son of the younger son of a peer, it was always clear that Peter would have to provide his own income, and consequently he was apprenticed from 1864 to 1869 to Joseph Samuda of London, a shipbuilder and engineer. Here he received his training in the techniques and skills of concrete manufacturing, which he was to employ with great acclaim in his later architectural career. Circa 1869, Peter qualified as an architect and engineer, and after a brief period in private practice in London working for architect and engineer Daniel Cubitt Nichols, he returned to New Zealand in 1872. He was then employed as an engineer by railway contractors Brogdon and Sons. During this period, he oversaw the construction of both the Blenheim Picton and the Dunedin Balcutha Railway lines, as well as the draining of the Tyree Plains, and the construction of tunnels on the Central Otago Railway some of which are today open to the public as part of the Otago Central Rail Trail. When these tasks were completed, he set up his own practice as an engineer and architect in Liverpool Street, Dunedin. Architectural Career From 1875, Peter seems to have devoted his life to architecture, in particular, ecclesiastical architecture. 
no doubt influenced by the fashion of the time, especially by the acclaimed Christchurch architect Benjamin Montfort, Peter initially designed in the Gothic Revival style, which he praised for, quote, the great richness and delicacy of detail, and the closer application of geometrical rules to architecture, more especially in the window tracery which exhibits great variety of design, together with an easier and more perfect flow into the various parts of the whole structure, unquote. The Gothic Revival style had become popular for church architecture in the British colonies, as it had in Britain itself, following the rise of the Oxford Movement, a school of Anglo-Catholic intellectuals who felt that medieval Gothic architecture inspired a greater spirituality than other styles based on non-Christian temples. The Anglican Church abroad adopted this theory as not only a nostalgic reminder of home to those empire builders, but also as holding out more hope of impressing the natives to be converted to Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church, however, of which Peter was a member, with its many priests trained in Italy, had no such limited vision. Thus, it was the Catholic Church which gave Peter his greatest opportunities of proving his worth as an architect by producing cathedrals, basilicas, and churches in a wide diversity of European-based styles. Peter's early speciality was his groundbreaking work in mass concrete, at the time a revolutionary form of construction. Three of his earliest projects were all constructed in this new form of building material. Judge Chapman's mansion, today known as Castlemore, the mansion nicknamed Cargill's Castle in 1876, and St. Dominic's Prior in 1877. He did, however, also work in more conventional building materials, according to the whims of his patrons. St. Dominic's Priory, Dunedin Peter described the style of his 1876-77 creation, St. Dominic's Priory, as Anglo-Saxon, referring to the straight-sloped window apertures. The style of the building, however, was very much Peter's own interpretation and only lightly influenced by Anglo-Saxon architecture. The building is notable for its use of poured concrete, a comparatively new building material in 1870s New Zealand, but one well suited to the creation of large number of windows in the building's façade. The structure is simultaneously grand and austere, well reflecting its use as a convent. St. Dominic's Priory was the largest unreinforced concrete building in the Southern Hemisphere, steel reinforcing being then an unknown construction method, and earned Peter the lasting nickname of Lord Concrete. Cathedrals. F. W. Peter designed three of New Zealand's cathedrals, each distinguished by a different architectural style. 1878, St. Joseph's Cathedral, Dunedin. While Peter designed many churches, schools, public buildings, and private houses, his largest and most grandiose design, the Roman Catholic Cathedral at Dunedin, was never fully completed. The entrance facade and the nave are the original design, and display the cathedral as a prime example of Gothic Revival architecture. Today, St. Joseph's Cathedral, which stands next to St. Dominic's Priory, seems reminiscent of many of the great Gothic cathedrals of Europe, with its twin towers and central rose window. Westminster Abbey and Notre Dame come to mind. Peter's original intention, however, was for a mighty structure, with the twin towers dwarfed by a huge spire some sixty meters, two hundred feet in height, which would have resulted in one of the most magnificent cathedrals in the southern hemisphere. In the event, the project was curtailed by a prudent Roman Catholic diocese reluctant to incur unnecessary debt. Peter's intention, which is clear from the almost ninety pages of drawings held in the archives of the diocese, was to design the most impressive cathedral in Australasia. The completed church is only a fraction of the size originally planned. Even without its intended spire and chancel, it is still an impressive edifice. Construction work began in 1878 and the building was consecrated in 1886. Its construction is notable for its foundations. Forty massive concrete piles, each over 1.2 meters, 4 feet in width, sunk 10 meters, 35 feet into the ground, giving the cathedral a firm foundation on volcanic bedrock. The nave is 24 meters, 80 feet in length, and 16 meters, 52 feet in height. The walls of the cathedral are in black basalt, with cornices of white Omaru stone a style for which Dunedin and Christchurch architecture is noted. See also Dunedin Railway Station. Peter was later to have two further opportunities at cathedral design, but St. Joseph's was to remain his largest work in the Gothic style. 1901, Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, Wellington. 
that Wellington's principal Roman Catholic cathedral is today a small but quite perfect Romano-Grecian temple is entirely the result of chance. The Sacred Heart Basilica, now a cathedral, was originally designed and conceived as a church to mark the site of the fire-gutted St. Mary's Cathedral. Peter had strong family connections to this site, as it, and an adjacent plot, now the site of St. Mary's College, had been given to the Roman Catholic Church by his father and grandfather. The original cathedral, a grandiose Gothic structure complete with flying buttresses, had been built in 1850, but was destroyed by fire in 1898. Within two days, Peter had been asked to design a new church on the site. A decision was taken, however, to build the new cathedral nearer the more densely populated areas of Wellington, Tiaro, and Newtown. Peter later published plans for this cathedral in 1903, describing his proposed structure as, quote, Roman, bordering on to Florentine Renaissance, treated liberally, unquote. Sadly, this cathedral project never came to fruition, but what was quickly constructed was the church, or basilica, of the Sacred Heart on the raised cathedral site. Architectural dictates of the day, issued in the 19th century by such architects as Pugin, and strictly adhered to by the recently deceased prominent New Zealand architect Benjamin Mountfort, decreed that only Gothic was suitable for Christian worship. Ignoring these rules, Peter daringly designed the new church in the Palladian style, which had only a few years before been considered almost heretical for worship. In 1901, when the church was designed, Peter's use of the Palladian as a style for such a high-profile building would have been unthinkable. The design was theatrical in the extreme. The imposing principal façade of Omaru stone consisted almost solely of one huge portico constructed of six ionic columns while the façade was crowned by a high pediment more in the style of Vitruvius than Palladio, and behind the great façade stretched the single body of the church, with the remaining façades in a less severe Romanesque style. Considering that his brief was that a, quote, serviceable church and brick should be erected on the site of the old cathedral, unquote, it is amazing that such an almost avant-garde style should have been permitted. The completed structure would not have been out of place in 17th century or 18th century Rome or Venice. The classically simple interior of the church continued the Palladian theme. The large nave was colonnaded, with the ionic column supporting a clear story of arch-topped windows, while the chancel was approached through an enormous arch which mirrored the Palladian Surlian arch, providing theater and drama at the high altar. The flat, compartmentalized ceiling is a more restrained version of that of the church of Santa Maria dei Miracoli in Venice. Unfortunately, the church's twin bell towers had to be removed following an earthquake in 1942. The cost of the new church was taken from funds intended for the construction of the new cathedral, thus delaying that project. After 70 years of delays, the intention to build the new cathedral was finally abandoned. In 1984, following new enlargements and additions, Peter's Church of the Sacred Heart was re-consecrated as Wellington's principal Roman Catholic cathedral. 1904 Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament, Christchurch. Of all Peter's many designs, the most outstanding is usually considered to be the Roman Catholic Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament in Christchurch, commonly known as the Christchurch Basilica, his largest completed work. Commenced in 1901, it replaced a smaller wooden church designed by Benjamin Mountfort, which had been in use since 1864. The cathedral was officially opened on the 12th of February, 1905, a mere four years after construction began. Today the building, said by some to be based on the 19th century church of Vincent de Paul in Paris, is held to be the finest Renaissance-style building in Australasia. Forsaking Mountfort's 19th century Gothic, Peter designed the new church in a Renaissance, Italian, basilica style, albeit with one major exception. Ignoring Renaissance convention, Peter obtained a greater visual impact by citing the Italianate green copper-roofed dome, not above the cross-section of the church, as in St. Peter's in Rome, but directly above the sanctuary. In Peter's opinion, this design element, coupled with the Byzantine altar apes, added extra grandeur and theater to the high altar. The nave and the chancel roofs were supported by colonnades of ionic columns, and the entrance facade of the cathedral was flanked by twin towers in the manner of many of Europe's great Renaissance churches. The central pediment, 
is in the style of Sebastiano Serlio. While often likened to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, it is conceivable that the greatest influence behind this great structure was Benoit Hafereng. During Peter's formative years studying under Hafereng in France, Hafereng had been the driving force of the reconstruction of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Boulogne sur Mer, a French cathedral that has a very similar plan to that of the Blessed Sacrament, including the controversial sighting of the dome over the altar rather than the center of the cathedral. The cathedral, constructed of concrete sheathed in Amaru limestone, was widely acclaimed, causing the famous author George Bernard Shaw to describe Peter as a, quote, New Zealand Brunelleschi, unquote. Fifty men were employed on the site, and an excess of 120,000 cubic feet, 3,400 cubic meters of stone, 4,000 cubic feet, 110 cubic meters of concrete, and 90 tons of steel were used in the construction. Problems with finding suitable stone for the construction of such a large structure caused financial difficulties during the construction, and a special bill was pushed through Parliament by then-Premier Richard Seddon in order to aid with the financing of the building. The total cost to the Roman Catholic Diocese was £52,000. Private Houses The styles in which F. W. Peter designed his private houses were as diverse as those of his cathedrals and churches. It seems that, Unlike many notable architects, he designed according to the wishes of his clients. Those who wanted a castle received a castle, and those who wished for a small mansion disguised as an English Tudor cottage were equally fortunate. A large private residence designed by Peter can be found in Lovelock Avenue, Dunedin. It was originally built for Judge Chapman in 1875 and christened Woodside, though it has been known throughout much of its history as Castle Amory. This imposing structure sits on the slopes of Dunedin's botanical gardens close to the University of Otago and is a triumph of restraint. The castle atmosphere is there, almost a Scottish baronial castle, but the battlements are merely hinted at by stepped gables. Large bay windows allowing light to flood in again merely hint at the Gothic. One has to study them closely to perceive that they consist of a series of lancet-type windows. The large octagonal chimneys reflect the design rather than being an ostentation. This design could have been a grim, bombastic faux castle, yet appears as a comfortable dwelling complete with loggia and conservatory. A lesser architect might not have been able to resist the addition of a small turret or pinnacle. Peter's ingenuity lay in knowing how to mix large windows and more comfortable features with the medieval, and then ascertaining the exact moment to halt the Gothic theme before it became a pastiche of the original. In this way, Peter was referring in a modest way to the original Gothic Revival period as conceived by such architects as James Wyatt, rather than the later Gothic, after it had fallen under the ecclesiastical Anglo-Catholic influences of such architects as Augustus Pugin in England and Benjamin Mountfort in New Zealand. One of Peter's abilities was that he could vary his style of architecture. In 1883, he built a mansion in Christchurch known as Lanmies for a local merchant. The style selected came to be known in New Zealand as the English cottage style. This was a complete reversal of his previous work. Rather than impressive grandeur, the style was intended to evoke rustic charm. However, the large size of these cottages made them more akin to Marie Antoinette's Petit Hameau at Versailles than a humble English cottage. Similar in nature to the work of George Devy at the same time in England, the style was a form of idealized Tudor with half-timbered black beams set into white painted walls beneath beamed gables and tiled roofs. This form of design eventually became very popular in England from circa 1910. Two of Peter's English cottages still exist close to each other in Cliffs Row, Dunedin, overlooking the sea in the suburb of St. Clair. Pinner House is a perfect example of this traditional style, adapted for the brighter and warmer southern climate with large windows and verandas. Ironically, a third house in this style, Peter's own residence, which was located directly opposite Pinner House, no longer exists. Personal Life The construction of one of his first large houses, the folly-like Cargill's Castle, for Edward Bowes Cargill, a local politician and later mayor of Dunedin, had a romantic connection for Peter. While designing the mansion, he fell in love with Cargill's daughter, Margaret. After a difficult courtship, Due to Peter's staunch Catholicism, 
in the Cargill family's equally staunch Presbyterianism, the couple were eventually permitted to marry, the marriage taking place in the castle's principal salon shortly after its completion in 1877. Sadly, the building itself was gutted by fire in the 1940s and it is today a preserved ruin. Peter and his wife had 13 children. Peter himself had been the third child of 16. In 1903, Peter was appointed consular agent for Italy in Dunedin following the death of Edward Cargill. He was a founder member of the New Zealand Institute of Architects, was elected a fellow in 1905, and was president of the Institute in 1907 to 1908. Unusually for a man at the peak of his profession, Peter was known as congenial and popular. He died at Dunedin in December 1918, following 42 years of architectural practice, and was buried at the Andersons Bay Cemetery, Dunedin. Evaluation For an architect, Dunedin was an exciting place to be in the late 19th century, due to its great prosperity and subsequent expansion just before and after the turn of the 20th century, these being largely the result of the central Otago gold rush of the 1860s, and the subsequent development of the refrigerated meat export trade. Peter certainly did not obtain his many important commissions because of a void of alternative architects. The equally versatile architect R. A. Lawson was responsible for several important buildings in the city, including the neoclassical ANZ building and the Gothic Revival Presbyterian First Church. W. B. Armson designed the Italian Renaissance Bank of New Zealand building in 1879, and George Troop was responsible for the magnificent Dunedin Railway Station. Nor did Peter obtain work, with the possible exception of the Sacred Heart Basilica at Wellington, because of his family connections. On the contrary, his Catholicism, at the height of the British Empire, possibly lost him more ecclesiastical commissions than those for which he was ever engaged. What stood out was his engineer's practicalities at overcoming almost impossible difficulties. St. Joseph's Cathedral, was actually built not only on the side of a hill, but also in a gully. His pioneering work with concrete and steel was of enormous value in a country where earthquakes were a constant risk. Peter's buildings, in whatever style, all had one common denominator, an attention to the smallest detail. It was said that his drawings of stones, window traceries, arches, and ornamentation were so precise that stonemasons could execute his intentions from one single drawing. It is this attention to detail which is outstanding. Whether the simple carving on the capital of an ionic column or the heavy ornate work on the monumental corbel of a Gothic design. While this precision enabled him to work so successfully in the wide range of styles as he did, it in no way inhibited his sense of developing design. In his own words, an architectural style could be, quote, treated liberally, unquote, and this is the key to the individuality of his designs. Dunedin's Royal Exchange Building is a Palladian town palace, yet has an almost Australian restrained Baroque design. Cargill's castle would not have looked out of place in the Cimini Hills of Italy. It also has an almost hacienda spirit. His work in the Gothic style was lighter and more delicate than that of Alfred Waterhouse, and equal in detail to that of Augustus Pugans. It has been said of his work that he never fully developed his vision or overcame the limitations of his training but his experience as an engineer equipped him to find sound, innovative solutions to many constructional problems. His placing of the dome at the Blessed Sacrament over the altar has also been criticized, as many feel it does not cohere to the design. However, others feel it was a stroke of genius, enhancing the interior. Francis Peter's work cannot be judged against that of the great classical architects of the Northern Hemisphere, who so clearly influenced him. He did not create a style or have a revival period named after him. His achievement was adapting and developing so many established styles well, whether through the new techniques of steel or concrete, or through more traditional building methods. He was given amazing opportunities to prove himself worthy as an accomplished and inspired architect. The many monumental buildings with which he provided New Zealand speak for themselves as to his talent. Works by Peter Woodside Mansion, Castle Amore, Dunedin, for Judge Chapman, 1875, Style, Gothic Revival. Cargill's Castle, Dunedin, for E. B. Cargill, 1876, Style, Mixed Italianate, Castellated Gothic. St. Dominic's Priory, Dunedin, 1877, Style, Gothic Revival. St. Joseph's Cathedral, Dunedin, 
1878 to 1886. Style, Gothic Revival. Guardian Royal Exchange Assurance Building, Dunedin, 1881 to 1882. Style, Palladian. St. Patrick's Basilica, Amaru, 1893 to 1903. Style, Mixed Palladian and Renaissance. Phoenix House, Dunedin, now Airport House, circa 1885. Sacred Heart Church, Dunedin, 1891. St. Patrick's Church, Lawrence, 1892. St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church, Milton, 1892. Sacred Heart Basilica, now Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, Wellington, 1901, style Palladian. Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament, Christ Church, 1904-1905, style Italian Renaissance. St. Mary's Roman Catholic Basilica, Invercargill, 1905. St. Patrick's Church, Wymate, 1908, style Romanesque with Italianate cupola and campanile. Church of the Sacred Heart, also known as the Tomorrow Basilica, 1910, style Byzantine. References J. Stackpole, 1976, Colonial Architecture in New Zealand. Published by A. H. and A. W. Reed. D. B. Wynne Williams, 1982, The Basilicas of F. W. Peter. Master of Arts Thesis, University of Canterbury. Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, Volume 2, 1870 to 1900, published 1993. H. Knight and N. Wales, 1988, Buildings of Dunedin. Published in Dunedin by John McIndoe Limited. ISBN number 0868681067. Further reading J. Hurd and J. G. Griffiths, 1980, Discovering Dunedin. Published in Dunedin by John McIndoe Limited. ISBN number 0868680303. External links Landmies, Peter's English Cottage Style www.historic.org.nz slash register slash listing detail dot ASP question mark RID equal sign 4907 Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament, Christchurch, New Zealand www.cathcolleg.school.nz slash normal slash cathedral dot htm Photographs of New Zealand Architecture, 1870-1910 Seven Peter Buildings are among those shown. www.ucnet.pe dot kr slash new percentage sign twenty zealand slash english dash new percentage sign twenty zealand dash zero four dash p r o s p e r t y dot h t m recorded may fourth two thousand five this sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org/copyleft/ftl.html.